Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special event to put us in the right mood before the imminent Yami Naraim. I want to tell you something about myself when I was a small child. My parents joined the then Kingsbury District Synagogue in the late 1940s, but for the high holidays and the Seder nights, we would go to the East End where my grandmother lived. I wanted to go to shul and my mother and grandmother would want to get me out of the way while they prepared the food. At that time, there were many active congregations around E1, but even at a time when I was at primary school, I knew that we were members of, the, of, a, of a United Synagogue and I wanted to go to a US shul there. I was taken to East, East London Synagogue and my mum would leave me there on my own. The shul was almost beyond the experience of a small child. It was a magnificent cathedral building constructed in 1876. That's the front. That's the main entrance. And that's the rear entrance. And that's the foundation stone where it says, laid in 1876 on behalf of the United Synagogue Organization by Lionel um, Lewis Cohen. It was a fine example of high Victorian Jewish architectural sty uh, style, magnificent shul. It, have a, it had a cavernous interior with a strongly oriental flavor and seated 600 worshippers. The Aaron Kodesh, that's looking towards the ark. That one is upstairs looking towards the ark from the ladies' gallery, had a rose window, an eight foot tall solid mahogany pulpit, plus a floor mosaic and leaded stained glass brasswork, an intricate carving, and there are the stairs leading up to the ladies' gallery. But it was the singing that gripped me. The Minhag Anglia still had sway, held sway, and the ministers wore canonicals. And that's a picture of Reverend Mendel's effort who was the minister at the East London Synagogue from 1928 to 1958. In the 1947 photo, he's standing to the right of the late chief rabbi, Dr. Israel Brody. The cousin was, I believe, the Reverend Aaron Fuchsman. It was reported that he was possessed of a rich baritone voice in the middle register. He has a wide range and his beautiful lyrical voice has fine tonal qualities. He is gifted not only with a splendid voice, but also with exquisite artistry. His interpretations of a sacred song in Hebrew and of Tchaikovsky's Tonight were a sheer delight to listen to. My mother would tell me to get back by a certain time so that they could lay the table for Seder, but I didn't, and I always stayed to the end of the service. She would say to me, where did you get to? And from that time onwards, I came to be hooked on traditional chazanut forever and a day. In the 1980s, there were Nusser Had filler courses offered at Jews College. Over a number of years, I did the full set for all occasions under two ministers well known to us all. Shalosh Regalim, taught by Reverend Steve Robbins, and Shabbat and Yami Naraim, under a man who lists his occupation on his website as rabbi, cantor, educator, composer, and magician. Tonight, my mentor, Rabbi Jeff Lee Schisler, and this year's Chatan Torah at Edgeware United will, I hope, provide us with a magical evening by interviewing three sons and a daughter of United Synagogue Cantors by asking them to talk about their fathers and play some of their cantorial music. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a delight to welcome you here this evening, especially for an evening of something that is so close to my heart. I'm delighted that we have with us four children of very, very fine Chazanim. London has been exceedingly fortunate over the years. It's had not just fine Chazanim, but in fact some of the finest Chazanim in the world. The tragedy is that in very early days, the United Synagogue didn't allow its Chazanim to record. And it, this was a bone of contention for very many years, and it's a great shame because it means that for certain people, for example, a cousin Taylor, there's almost nothing recorded. He didn't go into a recording studio and record anything. And he would have probably got told off very severely if he did. I do know that cousin Fagenbloom did under a different name. I remember him telling me uh, he did, did some things that 
United Synagogue fortunately didn't find out about, so we're, we are fortunate that we still have lots of recordings from him. So what we have this evening are the children. We're going to call upon each one to speak about his father for a while, and then we're going to play a piece of music I'm going to ask, uh, that, that they have selected, I'm going to ask them to explain why they selected the particular piece that they did. So we're going to start off with uh, um, Moshe Fagan, who's going to talk about his father. Cousin Pinchas Fagan. Um, I do a struggle to do this. Uh, start off by mentioning the fact that both my parents were survivors by one remove. By that I mean, fortunately, they were in England when the war was on, but they lost all their family, basically. They lost their parents, their, their brothers and sisters, cousins, and so on and so forth. And I think it's a, a common um, feature. I've known several survivors, and at the, begin at the first few years after the war, they very rarely talked about it to their children. Their children were the last ones to know what went on. And in fact, I think many of them didn't discover what happened to their parents until they eventually um, opened up and told other people what was going on. And then they realized what had happened to their parents. And so therefore, I'm in that way, I was, um, I would say denied, but my parents never talked to me about their home life as such. Um, and um, therefore, I was a bit of a loss. Well, I thought I would be a bit of a loss. But fortunately, um, I just to tell one little story. Uh, I was walking home from shul, from, to shul with my father. And I found my bar mitzvah time, and um, we were all very excited. And I said to Dad, um, now, what did you get for your bar mitzvah? Because he had it on a Thursday. So what did you get your bar mitzvah present? He said, I didn't get a patch all day. If you know what a patch is, yeah. Anyway, so that's about as much as I knew about my father's history. But I was very fortunate, we were very fortunate, that Ellie Delib, Eric Delib, Ellie Delib, um, who was a, um, a great aficionado of Chazanim, he loved Chazanot, and he loved Chazanim, and he was a great friend of the Chazanim in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I think even to the 80s, until he, he passed away. And I think he was secretary of the Chazanim's Association. So he kept a, um, a brief on what was going on. And he was particularly friendly with my father. And fortunately for me, he... Keep by the motor. Okay. Fortunately for me, he kept a... Um, uh, he made a, a, um, a biography of my father for which I may be able to make use. So I will start. Uh, my father, Pinchas Chaim Echeskel, was born in Warsaw in 1909 to Abraham and Esther Fagenblum. Eventually, they became a family of four sisters and a brother. In 1910, my grandfather, against his father's wishes, emigrated to Antwerp with his family to avoid conscription into the Russian army. I, I found out, as it happens, the reason why my great-grandfather was uh, reluctant to see my father go is because he thought if he left Warsaw, where he was um, born and brought up, he would become completely um, non he'd, lose, he'd lose his religion. That was the idea in those days. They were very, they were a very trusted, became a very trusted member of the community, and he became a senior shamus of the Van der Nestle Shul. And as he was a fine Baltifila, he became also a Chazan Sheni. My grandmother was musical and deeply religious, and she was the one who encouraged my father towards Chazanot on the basis that while engaged in a shul, he would have little opportunity to become a goy. That was her reason. She particularly encouraged clear pronunciation of his tefillot. And when, as a young man, he tried for a position, he would take his mother with him. And on returning home, she would say, I didn't hear that passage, or you mumbled. And when eventually she informed him she had had every single word, he knew he was on the way to becoming a proper chazan. He was educated in the Yisodi HaTorah, Tachimoni Yeshiva Eitz Chaim, and went to a music conservatoire. He and his brother were the first boys to start in the choir of the Hollandische Schule in Antwerp under Chazen Soblowski. Boys' voices were at a premium, and there was intense rivalry between shuls to attract the best voices. And it was in this fashion that my father, in the presence of talented Chazanim, absorbed his knowledge and love of shul music. In 1914, the family moved to London until the end of the war, and in those four, those four years gave him the ability to speak his good English, which he, I all remember he, he, he spoke very well. On their return to Antwerp, 
The very first important influence he encounters was Isaac Heilman, a talented musician who joined the family by marrying one of his sisters. Interestingly, Heilman knew Moshe Kuzovitsky, who for a time lodged with the family. Eventually, my father joined the adult section of the choir and branched out with three friends to form a quartet that included Joseph Dollinger, who you may have heard. They sang on the Brussels radio between 1933 and 1934 in an hour-long program, program singing Jewish, Spanish, German, and Italian songs, and they also gave concerts on Chazanut with music arranged by Isaac Heilman. My father remembers the golden era between 1926 and 1938 when great Chazanim visited Antwerp, in particular Josla Rosenbach, who dubbed Mariv with the Gantman Choir, of which my father was a member. Others included Chazanim Reutemann, Hirschman, and Sirota. My father recalled that Gersh and Sirota stayed in Antwerp over Shavuot and was asked to dubbin with the eight-man Gantman Choir. As Sirota had broken the Tikiat Kaf, Given in Warsaw, not to Dublin elsewhere, he could not use the synagogue, but had to re resort to a hall. My father spent two days in Sirota's presence, who during the rehearsals, sensing my father's inexperience, went out of his way to assist him with his entries into the music. My father said that his virtuosity as a Baltifila was impossible to grasp. He took his first position in Brussels in 1936 in the Rue de l'Angleterre Schule, and recalls that he must have arrived just before the Yom Yoroim because an official informed him that he wished, if he wished to officiate again, he would have to be married. As luck would have it, he was already engaged to my mother and they got married in 1937. Fortunately too, my father sensed that things were not going too well in Europe and sought a position in England in 1938. He was directed to the Nelson Street Safadish Shul in the East End by a friend, Chazan Jacob Sherman. And here he enjoyed a very warm relationship with the Rabbi Yoshua Spetman, who was also known as the Reuter Rebbe. And I believe it's because of his understandably enthusiastic support for the Russian army. <laughs> An important influence at that time was Chazan Adelman of Fulpot Street Great Synagogue. He once saw my father shockling as he davened and said to him, you're not going to stay here, are you? If you do, you want to learn to stand with dignity and with his controlled stance. And he was a lesson that my father took to heart. Another great cousin of great influence was Yankel, Yankel Kuzovitsky, with whom he lodged for a time. He davened once at Shackle Lane Shul, and it was said at that time that their style of chazan was similar. Between 1945, he moved to um, Winton's Shul, Winton's Shul, Winton Street Shul, Leeds, and in 1947 to Leeds's Park in Newcastle. And I remember that very well because um, uh, at Mincha, um, during the, during the um, winter, you could hear the shouts of the, of the crowd, in the football crowd, in, in St. James's Park, which is just over the road from the shore. In 1948, he received a call to Wilsdon, Heathrow Park Shore, and here he was inducted by the Chief Rabbi, Sir Israel Brody, whom he had befriended in Newcastle. And actually, he came to my bar mitzvah as well. It was of the greatest of good fortune that my father met Martin White, the conductor of the Jewish Male Voice Choir. They both admired each other's accomplishments, and Martin came to Wilson Shul, bringing with him a locally based group from the Jewish Male Voice Choir. Their cooperation resulted in the most memorable services, particularly on Yomin Tovim and Yomin Uroim. Looking back on that time, I realize now how much we took for granted. Now I miss the buzz of anticipation in the atmosphere as the congregation assembled for the first sounds of the dedicated, beautiful, atmospheric, spiritual, and inspirational services. My father's Yom Kippur Avodah was particularly memorable. My father also took an active part in the Melbourne Choir. He copied out all their music because at that time they didn't have photocopiers and often performed as a soloist. And in 1952, at a memorial service for Chaim Weitzman in the packed Albert Hall, he recited the Kelmei Rachamim with the choir. After 40 years serving the community, my parents retired to Israel and he was Niftar in 1984. At this point, I must add that the obvious that behind every successful man, there's a hardworking woman. There were very difficult times during the war, the worst winter in memory up north when we were in Newcastle, and of course, the post-war news for both my parents. 
But without my mother's vision of the future outside the United Synagogue, they would not have had the relative comfort that they eventually enjoyed in the Tanya. Finally, my father had a very large collection of 78 records, mainly of Chazanut, but also, as he was a musician, of all opera and classical music. Included in them were some that featured the white Russian Don Cossack Choir. This was a, um, a pre-war choir. Obviously, they were white Russians and they, they'd escaped from the, from the Soviet Union. This superb group exemplified the typical Russian choral sound, a deep grounded bass bass contrasting with high tenor voices, and the total effect was of raw power. Martin, who spent much time with my father listening to his collection, made use of these Don Cossack characteristics, combining them skillfully with the JMVC sound. Thus, the raw Russian energy was blended with the Jewish heart and soul, making their interpretation of Jewish liturgical music unique. And I've chosen, as a recording, um, actually it's not with Martin White, it's with the, uh, the conductor who, who, who succeeded him, a uh, very talented Manny Fisher, um, Manny, come on, Fisher, Manny Fisher, of course, um, who is a wonderful uh, conductor. Um, and it's the uh, Hinnany from the uh, Elman Sli um, my mind is going, hmm? Svirata. Svirat Homer, thank you. Um, the, they recorded both the Hinnani and the Rabbani um, uh, um, Unfortunately, there is no recording of the, the uh, Bracha, which I find is, the, is Almond's uh, masterpiece because it, it exemplified the mystical uh, atmosphere of the whole of the Sephira. Um, and I think this comes through to some extent with the Hinnani which includes a fuck choir and my father. <laughs>
this was made, this is a, a kosher recording, because it was actually made by the BBC. There was a time in the, I think, late 50s, early 60s, um, when the BBC, for one reason or another, had a slot at half past 11 when he was going to bed, um, introducing um, the liturgical music, which is done by the Jewish Memorial Choir and other soloists that they had, um, before the Yom Yom and before Pesach. And there were at least two sessions where they, um, they, were, they, were, they did this, and this is one of the recordings that they got, we've got from it. Thank you very much indeed. Incidentally, what Moshe didn't tell you is that his father had the most exquisite handwriting. His musical notation was, it looked like, looked like it had been printed. Absolutely amazing. All right, we now move on to Ilana, who's going to talk about her father, the late Reverend Moshe Korn. My father was born Moshe Manfred Korn in 1926 in Frankfurt, Germany. With the rise of Hitler and anti-Semitism in Germany, he and his family left in 1936, escaping via Holland and eventually arrived in Palestine. He attended school in Palestine. <clears throat> his talent as a chazan was recognized at an early age by the choir master and chazan Shlomo Ravitz of the great synagogue in Allenby Street in Tel Aviv. My father started taking services there from the age of 17. At the age of 19, he began to learn the diamond trade and was noted for his singing whilst he was polishing diamonds. He was encouraged to pursue a career as a chazan. In 1948, he fought in the Haganah during the War of Independence. And in 1954, he became chazan at the Bilu Synagogue in Tel Aviv. I was born in Israel in 1956, and when I was eight months old, my father was again in the Israeli army fighting in the Suez War. A report circulated that a soldier named Moshe, whose father worked in a particular factory, had been killed in action. It was believed that it was my father. There were two days of uncertainty until it was confirmed that it was not my father, but another soldier called Moshe, whose father worked in the same factory. <clears throat> so I'm just going to clear my throat. Later on in life, my father recollected with much sadness the loss of many of his friends in battle. The sergeant major in his unit was, I don't know if people remember, Yehuda Landenberg, who was later the cousin of Wilsden Shaw, and then he became a lifelong friend. We left Israel for Germany in 1957, where my father was offered a job Firstly, to the Frank to Frankfurt, and then to Cologne. He was a cousin in both shuls. My brother Doron was born in Cologne in 1958. In 1960, my father accepted a job in Rally Close Shul in Hendon, where he was subsequently cousin for 25 years. The first few years in Hendon were challenging for me, as I only spoke German after having attended kindergarten in Germany. However, it didn't take long for me to learn English, and eventually I forgot all my German. My writ was limited, but my parents only spoke English to me. They talked in Ivrit between themselves, not realizing that I gradually started to understand. I remember one day asking them why they spoke Ivrit in front of me and not English, and I said it was pointless that as I understood every word they were saying, and they were shocked. My sister Rebecca was born in Hendon in 1966. My father practiced Chazanut at home a lot, and he was also studied music at the Guild Hall in London. I remember being told to keep quiet during times he was teaching bar mitzvah boys or practicing. He also enjoyed playing the violin, he could read music, and I was forever hearing the sound of a tuning fork or noise of a piano as well as a metronome. I recall spending much time at the home of choir master Lionel Lee and his wife Celia. We used to go over there most Friday nights after dinner for a schmooze. And at that time, the shul was thriving and the choir was something special. I also recall with much fondness the late Reverend Leslie Hardman, who served alongside my father for so many years. They got on very well and I rarely heard a harsh word. 
There was also the late Moisha Steinhardt, who was the shamus for most of my father's years of service. As I grew up and went so, so regularly to shul, I remember the feeling of pride towards my father, appreciating the beauty of his sweet voice and enjoying his services with the choir. People came from far and wide to hear him sing. His kol nidre and midnight slichot were especially memorable. I loved hearing him sing with the choir, especially when he reached high notes with so little effort. On Shabbat, my mother and I always arrived at shul about 11 o'clock, just in time for Musaf. Being in the front row, it was difficult to sneak in unnoticed. Our timekeeping has not since changed for either of us. It's a standing joke. <laughs> the Chazanot continues with Doron's three boys, Moshe, named after his grandfather, Shmuel and Yosef, as well as Rebecca's son, Robert, and Rebecca's daughter, Sarah, who also sings. My father enjoyed singing with a London Jewish male choir with regular solos. I enjoyed going to see him at the various concerts in London. The choir also performed in the USA, Germany and Israel. At the time, the conductor was Emmanuel Fisher and I particularly remember fellow choristers being Nat Conroy, Alan Bill Gora, Monty Fisher and Paul Gershon. <clears throat> he also made some recordings with a German Philharmonic Orchestra. He sang at many Malava Malkas and charity concerts, often accompanied by pianist Handel Rosen, then later on Daphna Lewis, where he, also, where he was also renowned for telling jokes. He sang in English, Yiddish and Hebrew, and being a tenor, he also sang Italian opera. Occasionally, we all sang together as one family at various old age homes. My life revolved around the shul and various communal activities. It was my father, no, if my father was not at shul, he was visiting the sick in hospital or officiating at Bushy Cemetery or taking the service at a shiver house or together with my mother at a simcha on a Sunday evening. I miss those traditional days out on a Sunday as a family when other families went away for Yontov to places like Bournemouth. We were in Hendon with my father taking the services at shul. For several years, during two weeks in the summer, we went to Belgium and we were joined by the families of the late Hazen Aron Siegel of Southgate Shul and the late Hazen Yuda Landenberg. We were all very good friends. We used to rent flats near Knocker and bring all our food, crocker and cutlery with us. Looking back, they seemed like long drives with no mobile phones or iPads. Those were the good old days, no, no distractions. One major highlight for me was my wedding in 1979 at Rally Close. It was so special when my father walked me down the aisle, sang under the chuppah and stayed so composed. I remember insisting he did the whole wedding service, including the Sheva Brachot. In the end, I was the one in tears, not him. Throughout my life, my mother was there alongside my father, especially in his latter years, when he was so unwell. They made a great double act and she was his biggest fan as well as his loudest critic. I so lament the fact that he lived to see only one of his three children married, the birth of only two of his eight grandchildren, and that he left us in 1985 at such a young age of 59. His music lives on, you can check out iTunes and YouTube. I often meet people who knew him and who fondly recall the joy he gave with his singing. Whilst today I'm Ilana Goldberger, I'm also very proud to be the daughter of the late Chazen Moshe Kuhn, Zichono Libracha. What piece have you chosen? Um, Ki Lekach Tov with the London Jewish Male Voice Choir. It's one of my mother's favourites. Good enough, <laughs> Oh. 
I had the great fortune to know all these Chazanim. Uh, I was a very young, very green Chazan when, uh, when they were in their prime, as it were. Um, I, I remember Chazan Korn had quite a black sense of humor, don't you, if you remember. Because it's, it's silly how certain things stick with you. I don't know why, because it has to be 40 years ago, 45 years ago. I can remember being at a meeting of the Chazanim and we were trying to set up the date for um, the next meeting one evening some weeks ahead. And the Chazan Korn said, oh, I can't do that, I've got a shiver. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember. <laughs> if, you did, if you didn't know, Chazan Korn followed some of the greatest Chazanim uh, the, in, in Hendon, there was Chazan Kozovitsky, David Kozovitsky, there was Chazan Taub. That gives you some idea of how good he was, when he, when, even when he first came. Because to have been appointed then, he must have been good. And he, as you've heard again, boy was he. Now move on to Leonard Lowy, who's going to tell us about his father, the late Chazan Charles Lowy. Good evening. When uh, Rabbi Schisler invited me to participate in this evening's event, I have to say that my initial reaction was one of bewilderment and panic, which only abated when he assured me that he didn't want me to sing, only to talk about my late father, cousin Charles Lois, that's all. So here goes. He was born in Bratislava, formerly Pressburg, in 1911, the second of eight children. He studied in various yeshivas in Slovakia before finishing up at the renowned Hassam Sofi yeshiva in Pressburg. After attending evening classes in business and working for a time as a bookkeeper, in 1937, when many Jews were already rushing in the opposite direction, 
unbelievable though it sounds, he traveled to Munich to take up an appointment as cantor of the Linat Tzedek Reichenbach Synagogue. Whilst there, he also studied music and voice production at the Trapp Conservatoire of Music. After personally witnessing and being caught up in the shocking events of Kristallnacht in November 1938, he escaped from Munich and made his way to Hungary, eventually becoming chief cantor in a town called Solnok, about 120 kilometers from the capital. He also served for a time as cantor of Budapest's Rombach Synagogue, as well as assistant chief cantor at the magnificent Dohányi Street Synagogue, which if you haven't been there, is absolutely worth a visit. Between 1942 and 1945, he was forced to endure arduous and hazardous periods of forced labor under the Nazis. Following liberation at the end of the war, my parents were married in Hungary before leaving continental Europe for Glasgow in 1947, when my father received the call to become the chazan at Queen's Park Synagogue. After 12 years at Queen's Park, in 1959, the family left Glasgow and moved down to London, my father having been appointed cantor at the Hampstead Synagogue, where he served for 28 years until his retirement in 1987 at the age of 75, notwithstanding the United Synagogue's mandatory policy requiring ministers to retire at 65. Such was his popularity that on reaching 65, the Shaw's Honorary Officers had no qualms about finding and exploiting a legal loophole and negotiating with the US for him to be allowed to carry on. To be honest, even at 75, he hadn't particularly wanted to retire. But my mother was growing increasingly impatient with his relentless work ethic. And there'd also been some, shall we say, political machinations resulting in the loss of his beloved choir, and with it, much of his enthusiasm for carrying on. Back in the day, in United Synagogue circles, the so-called book of Jew sorry, the so-called blue book of Jewish liturgical music occupied a level of importance seemingly on a par with the Shulchan Aruch. Whilst in certain respects it would be fair to say that in those days Hampstead didn't always do everything by the book, when it came to the blue book, they treated it as Halokha Lamoshe Misinai. And upon arrival at Hampstead, my father was informed in no uncertain terms that he would have to master it which as a consummate professional, he quickly did, right down to the separate and distinctive Yigdal melodies for each of the different Yomim Tovim. So much so that when he passed away in 1998, his obituary in the Jewish Chronicle described him as the exemplar of accepted Ashkenazi Nusach. Not only did he master the so-called Minhag Anglia down to its finest detail, but having been brought up in a very orthodox background, and with an extensive yeshiva education, he actually understood not only the meaning, but even the subtle nuances of everything he sang. Without wishing to be controversial and in passing, it does seem that these days Nusach seems to be disregarded and increasingly unknown. In some places, not I hasten to add in this holy congregation, what you often get is an uneasy mix and match with a bit of Shabbos, a bit of Yontav, and some Israeli popular song, a Hasidish nigan or two, perhaps even the odd secular melody thrown in for good measure. Many reasons have been suggested for this state of affairs, but that's another discussion altogether. Interestingly, despite having been born into a long line of Chazanim, my father hadn't actually wanted to become a Chazan at all. His father and grandfather, the latter in particular, a cantor of great renown in Hungary, had to push and cajole him in the face of some considerable initial reluctance. Fortunately for Anglo Jewry, my father never tried to influence me to join the family business. I think he'd identified pretty early on that I didn't have what it takes. And also, by the time I reached my late teens, I think he'd seen the writing on the wall, causing him to remark, not entirely tongue-in-cheek, that Chazanut was no longer a job for a Yiddish boy. 
No disrespect to anyone present, but I think it's fair to say that Chazanim generally tend to be rather extrovert personalities. Well, my father was the exception that proved the rule. He was a quiet, humble man who shunned publicity. In that regard, he was almost a walking contradiction in terms. I vividly recall him trying to explain time and again why he just turned down some invitation or other to perform in a concert somewhere. That kind of limelight just wasn't for him. My late uncle, Reverend Ernest Levy, Zichrona Livrocha, himself no mean chazan and for many years the renowned cantor of Gifnok Shul in Glasgow, and by sharp contrast a very outgoing personality, rarely missed an opportunity whenever we met to bemoan my father's diffidence in that respect. I had the star quality, he would say to me, but your father had the voice. In thinking about which of my father's recordings to play this evening, I was torn between two choices. A self-declared favorite of his was Samuel Alman's Kiddish for Rosh Hashanah Evening, a deceptively simple work drawing largely on the traditional Yomim Neroim Nusach that ingeniously manages to press all the right emotional buttons at the onset of the solemn High Holy Day period. My father loved it, and I'll confess it never failed to make my eyes well up when I heard him sing it on Rosh Hashanah evening. You can find it on YouTube. And yes, given the time of year, it would have been a logical choice. But in order to showcase my father's compositional abilities as well as his chazanut, in the end I've gone for his self-composed Sheva Brochus. I've calculated that he must have sung this under the chuppah hundreds of times during a career spanning half a century including at my own wedding, which makes it especially poignant for me. This particular recording dates from July 1960 and was made at the wedding of Dudley Cohen, who was at the time both the choir master at Hampstead and also the founder and choir master of the renowned Zemel Choir. I'm delighted to say, I didn't know this until half an hour ago, that two of the choristers who sang on that particular recording are present in the audience here tonight. This recording forms part of a collection of recordings which we only discovered amongst my father's personal effects after he'd passed away, and which were subsequently released on CD by the Jewish Music Distribution Company as part of its Jewish Music Heritage series. Sorry to sound commercial, but if anybody wants one, I have some copies of the CD with me here tonight. 100% of all proceeds go to charity, specifically to the Pressburg Yeshiva, relocated in Jerusalem after the war, and which my father continued support to support financially for the rest of his life. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Leonard. I think you should know that uh, Edgware United Synagogue, one of its great attractions for me, is that we insist on all the Blue Book melodies. If you want to have them here on Yom Tov, you've got to sing the right Yigdal, you've got to sing the right Hodu, and it's wonderful. Uh, just one, one other thing to, to mention about your dad, if I may. Um, I remember he was a marvellous raconteur. He had a reputation for being a fantastic after-dinner speaker. And I know, I remember quite a number of occasions when we had Chazonim uh, get, get togethers, gets together, get together, where he was, we invariably would ask him to chair the meeting because he was, he was great fun. Hey, we move on now to Chazon Taylor, our fourth Chazon this evening, and Stuart's going to tell us about him. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked to provide a profile of my father, the late Maurice Harold Taylor, whom my friends used to refer to as the Reverend M.H. Hashatz Moshe Tzvi Ben Tzvi Hirsch Halevi. My father's story and background is quite a contrast to the distinguished profiles that you have heard earlier this evening. My father was English. He was born in London, raised and educated in London, and eventually he trained to be a chazan at Jews College in London. He did not come from a long line of chazanim. We are not even aware if there are any chazanim in his family. He did not plan to become a chazan. He was expected to be a member of the family fur business. But through a series of events in his early life, which were marred by tragedy, he came to the realization in his early 30s that his life's mission was to become a chazan. The key to my father's early life is in his full Hebrew name, Hashatz, obviously for Shaliach Tzibor, Moshe Tzvi Hirsch ben Tzvi Hirsch Halevi. He was named after his father, who died in the Spanish flu epidemic in July 1918, at the young age of 25, just two months before my father was born. His grandmother wanted to name him after, after his father. He wanted, she wanted to call him Harry in English and Tzvi Hirsch in Hebrew. But she was persuaded by the family that it would not be appropriate to name the baby after someone who died so young. She therefore added the name Moshe and amended the English name from Harry to Harold. My father was brought up by his mother and his maternal grandmother. Apart from his first name, another lasting change that my grandmother made was to register him at school with the surname Taylor rather than the family name of Schneiderman because she did not want her son, who was an only child with no father, to be bullied at school with an obvious Jewish name. Growing up, his first experience of synagogue music was as a boy singing in the choir at the Stepney United Synagogue, which you've just seen uh, pictures of on the screen, which I heard being said over there at one time had a large mixed choir. The story moves on to the outbreak of war in 1939. Many people didn't speak about their wartime experiences, but we believe that due to his reserved occupation, my father found himself in Dublin during the war, where my mother, who was also from the East End, joined him, and they married at the Adelaide Road Synagogue in Dublin in November 1939. My father sang in the choir at Adelaide Road and very quickly became the soloist with his unique high tenor voice and vocal technique. The chazan in the shul was a chazan freilach. 
They were very close in age and became very good friends. Some of you in this room may know better than me, but I understand that there were three or four Freyloch brothers, or maybe they were cousins, who were all chazonim. One was the very well-known, long-serving chazan at Hampstead Garden suburb. Another brother was the chazan in Stanmore from 1957 until he retired in 1972. And the other was the chazan in Dublin. Tragedy struck again when in around 1947, Chazan Freyloch of Dublin died suddenly at the age of 34. My father was devastated at the loss of his close friend and colleague. On the following Shabbat morning, the honorary officers asked my father to lead the services, but he initially declined as he did not wish to stand in the shoes of his good friend. Eventually he agreed and took on the role of Chazan while still working in business during the week. Very soon, Dad realized that being on the bimmer was where he wanted to be and decided that he wished to become a professional chazan. With the encouragement of the shul rabbi and the rabbi's wife, the newly appointed and newly married Emmanuel Amelie Jacobowitz, Dad applied and was accepted on the course at Jews College to qualify as a minister chazan, or minister reader, as they were then called. Our mother encouraged him every inch of the way, and she agreed to stay behind in Dublin while my two older brothers, Alan and Norman, who are with us today, uh, I wasn't born yet, of course, um, while Dad attended the course. Jews College, at the end of the 1940s and early 50s, was going through a golden age, but unfortunately for some negative reasons, because with the devastation in Europe and Israel not yet established, as a place of further Jewish education. Jews College was the, about the only place in Europe where a person could go to qualify as a congregational rabbi or chazan. Dad made many lifelong friends there, including chazan Fagan, who was the chazan of this shul, and chazan Plasco, uh, Bernard Casper, who went on to be the chief rabbi of South Africa, and many others. Before finishing the course, my father was appointed for a short period as the chazan at Finsbury Park. And then he was, in 1951, he was appointed to Dollis Hill, which at that time was one of the premier positions in the United Synagogue, in the thriving wider Jewish area of Wilsdon, housed in a striking modern building. Being one of the star graduates of Jews College in 1951, and also being English in the immediate post-war era. Dad had a number of offers. But although it may seem strange, with the benefit of hindsight, Dollis Hill was the obvious choice at the time. This place had not yet been built. Stanmore was still in Nissen Hut, and the Hertfordshire communities had not yet been established. The Wilsdon area was the leading Jewish area of Northwest London in the immediate post-war era. It had four large United synagogues, of which my father was one chazan, uh, chazan Fagenblum was another. It had two Federation synagogues, three shtibels. At a time when Jewish schools were less fashionable, uh, there were two Jewish primary schools, a boys' secondary school, the B'nai Kiva Bayit, a yeshiva and a kolel. Wilsdon and the surrounding areas of Dollis Hill and Crookwood was the place to be. My mother was also attracted to the position because it came with what was then a modern four-bedroom house with a garden where her little boys could run around and play. Dollis Hill was also graced at the time with the illustrious Rabbi Isaac Swift, who was a rising star of the Commonwealth Rabbinate. He left Dollis Hill for Australia and then went on to Englewood, New Jersey, where he was one of America's leading rabbis. Dad was an exceedingly loyal minister, and he remained in Dollis Hill Synagogue for 44 years. He became the longest serving United Synagogue chazan in any one shul. The second being chazan Plasco at Woodside Park, who served the congregation for 43 years. Dad loved his community, and his community loved him. He officiated at weddings, bar mitzvahs, and other life cycle events for literally generations of the community. As the members of the community declined, he refused to, to retire, as he wished to continue to serve them 
until sadly he was taken ill on the Bima just after Pesach in 1995, <clears throat> and he passed away a few weeks later. One of the most eerie recollections and coincidences of my life was that Dollis Hill was scheduled to close in July 1995. The last service in the main building was on Shabbat the 15th of July 1995. On the Sunday, they took down the parochas. My father died just five days later on the following Friday. It was really the end of an era. The lavoya which took place on the Sunday went into the shul and as the hearse passed along the street by the shul, the non-Jewish neighbours came out to pay their respects. Moving on to the music, which is the focus of this evening, one of the fondest memories which people have of Dollis Hill was the Chazan and Choir. When my father was first appointed, the choir master was the well-known Manny Fisher, who seems to have been mentioned many times this evening, of the male voice choir. He was followed by other able and charismatic choir masters, such as Alf Bramson and Umi Shapiro, who is represented here. Where is he? Over there. <laughs> His son's over there. There was a choir almost until the shawl closed, but while I was growing up, the combination of chazan and choir was magnificent. The choir usually comprised some eight to ten men and about 15 boys singing alto and soprano. It was a powerful sound. Like my father, the choir masters learned their craft in the East End synagogues. So the Dollis Hill repertoire was firmly based in the music of Duke's Place, Stepney United, The New, and Hackney Brent House Road United Synagogues. My father, and it's been said of other chazanim this evening, was a stickler for the correct nusach and was particular to ensure only that the correct blue book tunes were used for each festival, including the correct yigdal for each festival. He knew his nusach back to front. If you woke him up in the middle of the night and asked him the most obscure question about shul liturgy in the high United synagogue tradition, he would immediately know the answer. His party trick was to mix up the tunes for the different festivals on Simcha's Torah, which those who have tried it may know is not easy at all. But my brothers and I would always tell him that most of the congregants did not understand the joke. It, was difficult to, it is difficult to describe a voice. Dad is best described as a lyric tenor. He had a very high, distinctive voice, which never sounded harsh or forced. His voice sounded effortless, even when singing the most complex pieces. He loved vocally challenging pieces and was equally at home singing opera as well as chazonas. To the delight of the choristers, he would regularly hit top C's, top D's, and on a good day, even top E flats during the service. You could see that the choristers would take out their tuning forks and go, what was that note he just sang? It was quite something. Dad dressed as the archetypal 1940s trained Jews College United Synagogue minister. He wore full canonicals, cap, gown and tabs, which my mother would iron every week. He wore the full garb every Friday night, Shabbos morning and Shabbos mincha. Until the mid-1980s, during the week, he would wear a Homburg hat, black jacket and striped trousers, even when riding his bicycle, which until the mid-1960s was his means of transport. He was the treasurer of the Chazonim Association and was the Chazonim's representative at the US Council for about 40 years, until he died in 1995. It was a role which he considered to be a great honor. He was a committed pastoral minister and also committed to the non-judgmental, inclusive orthodoxy of the United Synagogue. Reverend Taylor was a United Synagogue man and he kept to its rules. And I'm now going to refer to something that's been mentioned a couple of times already. One of the rules which made its, mark, it's made its mark on this evening's program. There is an apocryphal bylaw in the United Synagogue, which is often quoted, which states that the rabbi and chazan must be in their seats fully rowed five minutes before the commencement of the service. I have to say that even though I was chair of the United Synagogue Constitution Committee for six years, I have never found this bylaw, and I doubt that it ever existed. However, 
Bylaw Q15B of the old bylaws is draconian and stated that no minister reader shall make a recording of any liturgical or other music for reproduction without the prior consent in writing of the honorary officers of the synagogue and the honorary officers of the United Synagogue. My father kept to the rules. And as a result, we regrettably have no professional recordings of his wonderful voice. The recordings which we have here this evening were taken, as we say, still a hate, from the choir gallery during the rehearsals and at a wedding. I understand we're only going to have one this evening, and this was taken, it was recorded by Ormi Shapiro in the choir gallery in 1968 during the rehearsals for Pesach. I don't know if any of you remember Dollis Hill, but it was next to a park. And if you listen carefully, you can hear the birds singing in the park because the uh, windows were open. I'm not quite sure how much of, I believe it's going to be um, Ibn not the bulk of it, but not from the beginning, because the, the, the tape was completely mangled. So the, the very beginning, sadly, Ibn Khatuainu, <coughs> it's not there. There's not too much of the chazan in that. You're going to hear the best, believe okay. me. You'll hear the vocal acrobatics, which he so loved. It's a bit of a voyage of discovery for me, because I gave the CD to, to Jeffrey, and uh, I understand he's found someone to uh, tidy up Tony, the... Tony, Tony. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, you'll hear his vocal acrobatics. I'm just going to finish with a short recollection that Rabbi, Chief Rabbi Mervis told me of a conversation that he had with Reverend Plasco when he retired after 43 years at Woodside Park. They noted that the Hebrew of 43 is Mem Gimel, which could be read as Mug. Mug, he said. What about Reverend Taylor, who served at Dollars Hill for 44 years? Mem Dullard, mad. <laughs> Mug or mad? My father enjoyed every minute of his life as a cousin. It was a labor of love. Thank you for listening.
good, good, good introduction. I remember Gazan Taylor so well. I remember when I was very young, he was exceedingly kind to me when I started started as a, you know, as a member of the Chazanim Association. I have very warm and fond memories of all these four Chazanim, uh, not just for their phenomenal Chazanut, but for their friendship and for their warmth towards a young Chazan who thought he was better than all of them put together anyway. Uh, this would be a very appropriate time to thank Tony for uh, all the technical work he's done for us today. Oh, and Spencer just told me to let you know, if you want to sit through it all again, it'll be on YouTube soon. <laughs> uh, please tell your family. Um, I'm going to ask you in a moment if there's anything you'd like to ask, but before you do that, I've got a question I want to ask. And actually, before that, I'm going to ask Leonard something, because he said he wanted to tell us something about a mixed choir in Hampstead. He had an, had an anecdote for us. Well, Hampstead, I, I think it's quite widely known that um, certainly till, probably till about the 1960s, uh, mixed choirs were not uncommon in the United Synagogue, and Hampstead was the, um, certainly the last surviving mixed choir. It, it resisted few attempts at abolition uh, successfully, but the tide was turning and uh, eventually it had to succumb to the inevitable, I think in the mid-1980s. But there was a story that my father was very fond of telling, that one Shabbos morning uh, a particular visitor came to Hampstead. Uh, there was either a bar mitzvah or an offer of there was some simcha or other, and a visitor came and he was very, very disconcerted to discover that the shul had a mixed choir. At the end of the service, he accosted my father, probably in the Kiddush, and he went over to him and he said, Chazan, he said, I don't understand. He said, you're a from man, you've been to yeshiva, you're a man of learning, you know what's what. How can you tolerate men and women singing together? So my father was very, very quick-witted, turned to the man and he said, I don't have a problem with men and women singing together. My only objection is when the men and women sleep together during the sermon. I'd like to ask you, all four of you the same question. What did you personally like about your father being the cousin and were there any things you actually didn't like? Moshe. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, the thing that I always remember is don't do that, remember you're the husband's son. <laughs> that was the main thing. Um, you know, everybody else was able to do what they wanted, but I was the husband's son. And if I had to be, um, make, a bit, you know, make a special effort. Um, what I did think, you like? Very difficult to say. I, I suppose with pride, I think um, seeing my father, I still have this memory, not memory, I have a picture of my father standing <clears throat> in actually in Warm Lane Shul with his um, canonicals on, with the high hat, the on um, Yom Yoroim, all white, um, on the beamer, and um, just doubling there. And to me, this is like a like an angel standing there. It was, it was, it was a very special, very, I was very proud of him. Um, but I was very aware of his, um, the fact that uh, as a chazan, he was very conscious of uh, keeping his voice going. Um, any cold that happened, it was said to be right away. The other thing I also know is that his dedication to chazanot. Um, before Yontov, Yom Tov. Forgive me, but, but we are, we're running a bit short. Oh, right, okay. time, was really m concerned mainly with the things you personally liked so much, which I think you've told us. Thank mm. you. Yes, is there anything else particular? No, I think this Lovely. Just, Thank just you, Ilana. Yeah. Um, I disliked that the shul usually came first as a child, and the family often had to be put to second best. Um, but I realised as I got older that it was his job, and he had to put food on the table. Um, but the thing I did like, that I felt it was, I was an important part of the community, and the fact that he was held in high esteem. Lovely. Then. I've actually not, not ever given that a moment's thought. I mean, I can't really say that. I, I, 
there was anything that I liked or disliked. It was just normal because that's what it was and I had nothing else to compare it to and that's who he was and um, we loved him for it and uh, I can't really compare it to anything okay. else. Okay, that's so, a good um, answer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, as Leonard it says, it was, it was normality. That's, that was our lot in life, and we didn't think anything of it. I was just thinking on, on, in the car on the way here, it was very interesting. The very first time that I heard of a father going to work was when I started going to play with children in school when I was about eight or nine. We never, that, going to work was not in our vocabulary. Uh, where was dad? Dad was learning laning, Dad was going to a shiver. Dad was in shul. Dad was doing a hospital visit. He was doing a home visit. He was never going to work. It wasn't work. It was his vocation. Mm. And then I'd go and play with a friend. Oh, where's Dad? Oh, he's at work. And I, I had to scratch my head to work out what Dad did when they were at work. <laughs> but uh, that, 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 that's a, a definite recollection. And I'm going to say something very controversial now, actually. Um, Ilana just mentioned that she resented to a certain extent that uh, the shawl came first. I never experienced that growing up, but I did experience that very late on in life. Um, you know, Dad died age 76 and he didn't retire. Uh, he could have retired earlier, but he decided not to. And in later life, when he could have retired, the shawl always came first. And I think the ministers these days have got that balance a little bit better, that life-work balance. And sometimes the shawl should not come first. And there comes a time in life when you say, you know, I've done enough, thank you. I'll go away for Pesach. The shawl can wait. I'll and drink to Sometimes that. I said, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something which might embarrass Norman, but I'll say it anyway because I think it's important. Norman was... Hosn Torah, Hosn Bracious, and his shawl eight months before Dad died. And he begged Dad to go. And he said, no, I can't. The shawl needs me. I've got to be there for sure. And, of course, he never survived to uh, see another Simchus Torah. And it's a great regret that he wasn't there. And I think that uh, it's a good thing that ministers these days have a bit more of a balance between shawl and their family life. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time just for one or two points. I know that my friend Hazel Brickman is itching to say something. Say it loud, otherwise I wouldn't. No, we haven't, so we haven't got time. Say it very loud. He's I a Hazel, he can. <laughs> but, don't, we don't no want a, no, no statements, Stanley. No statements, just very quickly. <laughs> First of all, Mine is a quarter past ten. It was ten. the most beautiful synagogue, was the East London Synagogue, Rectory Square. I was cousin there for a short time in 1958. And um, they had a mixed choir there, no problems. And all that is left, we went on a visit of the East End some months ago, is the fascia of the shawl has been left, but the rest has been turned into a... Um, an art gallery and also uh, flats, apartments, apartments. It was my pleasure to know Cousin Fadenbroom, the late Cousin Fadenbroom. And Moshe, I tell you something you'll be happy with, I hope. You said he, that you didn't recall the bracha, but I heard him on many occasions. And the occasion I remember him singing, um, Sefirah to Omer was at one of our meetings, was on his meetings. And he started. It was terrific. I'm not going on, but that was true. And I remember him by that. And each time I sing it, I do remember him. Ilana, your late father. I was out of London from '65 till I returned in '86, traveling around this country and also being Chazan at the Great Synagogue, Cape Town. I never overknew him. Of course, when it comes to Lenny, well, your father I knew some 63 years ago or more. It was in Oswestry when he went to see your sister in hospital. Mm -hmm. And we had a little room there we used to sing. And he said to me, you should become a cousin. And many years later, I returned to London. I hope you can all hear me. I returned to London and I met cousin Lowy and he said, I went to... Um, the Hampstead Synagogue, and he said to me, 
I'm retiring today. The honorary officers was there. Do me a favor. Go in, and I'm sure they will appoint you. I went in, and I was cousin there for 17 Too long. Too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only had one person there who wasn't good. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> and then come to cousin Taylor. I used to visit him on so many occasions. A wonderful voice. It says, Adam. you may have a voice, you may have a BA and MA, but he was a true, true mensch. He was a true servant of the community. Mixed choirs, who were a bit frightened, I davened in about four or five shuls where there were mixed, where there were mixed choirs. Uh, and um, um, that's all really I have to say. Thank you very much. Say, but I hope it's a shame, it's only a shame today that the chazan, the word has gone out of our vocabulary. I often dabbled with a mixed choir. Some could sing and some couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have a, a point that they'd like to read, Robert? Yeah, the Crick had talked about a mixed choir, which was a cause of concern, but also a cause of humour at the end. Um, one of the chief rabbis uh, who lived at uh, Hamilton Terrace didn't like going to Hampstead Shul, but when he had to go to United United then Lennington Park was the one he went to. Yeah. And uh, my friend Dudley Cohen was the conductor of the choir at that time. He met the chief rabbi uh, on a young morning in the lobby and said, Chief Rabbi, are you pleased to hear today that we don't have a mixed choir? The chief rabbi was stirred. He said, well, how did you manage that? And Dudley said, well, it's Thursday morning today. All the men are at work. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can, I just, can I just make a comment? Um, the late chief rabbi Brody, um, I think he, was, he either decided or was told that because Hampstead was one of the US's, at the time, one of the major constituent synagogues, so he had to visit them occasionally. And I think his time for visiting Hampstead was on Shmini Atzeret. And the story goes that he was there one Shmini Atzeret morning. At the end of the service, one of the congregants went over to him and said, well, Chief Rabbi, how did you enjoy the mixed choir? To which he responded, unfortunately, it was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> right, well I think ladies and gentlemen that's it, I do hope you've enjoyed this evening, we've heard some beautiful, beautiful singing we've had some insights into the lives of some people who filled very important positions in our lives, in the lives of Anglo Jewry, people that many of us will never ever forget um, as I say, if you want to hear it again, you can hear it all again on YouTube. And in the meantime, we wish you all kitvuva, kitmu tova, have a wonderful, healthy and happy new year.